finishing up Chapter 2, the government joined in, issuing its own stern reports on the tide of feeble-mindedness, a study prepared for the California State Legislature in 1915 said the problem had always existed, but only recently have we begun to recognize how serious a menace it is to the social economy and moral welfare of the state, they quoted. Um, the same year, Virginia State Board of Charities and uh, Corrections published a booklet on the problem using the phrase that now seemed to be everywhere, quote, the menace of feeble-mindedness and assuring Virginia's, Virginians their state was taking steps, quote, for the elimination and prevention of this evil. Yeah, they were literally thinking of these people as evil. This is how they're swaying the populace, by the way, because, you know, obviously people everyday people aren't looking into this and they think that the people who are looking into this are, are on their side but yeah this is basically like witch hunt shit um the anxieties of these experts were mirrored in the general interest media which was engaged in its own mania scientific american warned in 1912 that the quote rep reproduction of feeble-mindedness was rife in much of the country an article the following year in Life and Health, the National Health Magazine, hel helpfully explained that the time was approaching when feeble-mindedness, which was, quote, definite, inheritable, Mendelian unit trait could be eliminated, allowing society to cultivate instead the valuable physical and mental traits and talents. For sheer poigen, poigen, poigency, um, mixed with strong dose of alarm, few articles could rival, quote, The Village of a Thousand Souls, published in the American Magazine in 1913. Arnold Gassell, who was then a, ju a junior professor at Yale, returned to his all-American hometown of Alma, wise wisconsin gazelle claimed to have found that about a quarter of the residents showed signs of feeble-mindedness or insanity and he called for eugenic measures including isolation and uh to uplift his uh beleaguered uh hometown eugenics and the mania over feeble-mindedness arrived at a time when America was particularly receptive. The start of the 20th century was an era of fast-paced, disruptive change. A rural residence fled farms and small towns. The United States was transforming from a predominantly rural nation to an urban industrial one. And in the process, community and family ties were breaking down. And in the process, this was taking place, uh, community was breaking down as industrialization was taking place, yeah. At the same time, immigrants were arriving in record numbers, dramatically altering the country's religious, cultural, and racial makeup. Um, but this didn't have any, uh, this had no ties to the, uh, the stresses of the industrialization world that they were dealing with, which was uh, dividing up families and such like that but this was soon used as an excuse for the dividing families and stressful times that the industrial revolution was causing um anyways these rolling changes caused considerable social anxiety and ushered in what the historical richard hofstadter called the age of reform native-born white middle-class protestant american mobilized americans mobilized to put their own imprint on a nation in transition by uniting behind an, ar an array of causes. They fought corrupt urban political machines. They agitated for safer factories and against child labor. They campaigned for improved public education and for women's rights. These reform campaigns were one history of a period explained a response to the crisis caused by the great changes the nation was undergoing, quote, a counter to these movements that threatened to transition, that trend to tr 
threaten to transform American society in more fundamental ways. If the age of reforms about native-born, white, Protestant, middle-class trying to build the nation in its own image, eugenics fit right into the ethos of the era. The reformers believed in using intelli intellectual tools, including science, to uplift and purify society. And this was just sort of the promise eugenics was holding out. The old stock reformers could not prevent the country from urbanizing or spawning teeming immigrant neighborhoods, and they could not prevent the nation's cultural and religious composition from changing. They could, however, do battle with what they were being told was an alarming rise in, quote, the diseased, the deficient, and, quote, the demented. The eugenicists matched the demographic profile of the reformers of the era. Both the leaders of the eugenics movement and the rank and file were largely middle class, well educated white and Protestant. Hafstetter observed that professionals and intellectuals were in the forefront of the reform movement of the era. They were the sort, he noted, quote, who see the drift of events and then throw their weight on the side of what they feel is progress and reform. So it was this eugenics it appealed in particular to academics and professionals, including lawyers, doctors, social workers, and journalists. In the legal profession, support for eugenics came from the very top when Connecticut enacted the nation's first eugenic law in 1895, a ban on certain marriages. The American Bar Association's president rate praised it as a necessary practical deterrent. James C. Carter used his president's address that year to declare that government must prevent unhealthy progeny to protect future generations from the evil operations of the laws of heredity. The highest echelons of the medical profession also regard largely supported the eugenics movement. At the American Academy of Medicine's first meeting of the 21st century in June uh, 1900, its president called for laws to prevent, as the title of his address put it, crime, pauperism, and mental deficiency. Dr. G. Hudson McCuen argued that medicine, as it was currently practiced, was counterproductive. We prolong the lives of weaklings, he said, and, and make it possible for them to transmit their characteristics to future generations. Many religious leaders actively promoted eugenics to their flocks and to the nation. Their very Reverend Walter Taylor Summer, Dean of the Chicago's Protestant Episcopal Cathedral of Saints Peter's and Paul, announced in... 1912 that he would only marry couples with a certificate of health from a per reputable physician. A few months later, the New York Times reported that 200 Chicago clergy adopted a resolution urging pastors to direct their er energies toward creating public opinion, endorsing Dean Summers' plan. Other religious leaders offered their houses of worship. Uh, New York's West End Presbyterian Church was organizing the center, with Reverend D. A. E. Kedwin convincing his fellow Protestant clergy to quote push a eugenics campaign. Women were active in all of the movements during the Age of Reform and were all presented in the ranks of the eugenicists. Many influential feminists supported the cause, including the writer Charlotte Perkins Gilman and the birth control uh, crusader Margaret Sanger. Sanger lectured to the Vassar College audience on the importance of reducing the rapid multiplication of unfit and desirable. Women were particularly influential at the grassroots level. In the early 21st century, women were largely excluded from politics and public policy. 
They could not vote until 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920. Many legislators, however, considered eugenics, eugenics with its focus on reproductive issues a proper realm for female guidance. Women were among the most active lobbyists for eugenic laws of all kind. The historian Edward J. Lar Larson, in his study of Southern eugenics, concluded that in every state in the Deep South, uh, federated women's clubs played a decisive role in establishing eugenically segregated institutions for the mentally retarded. So basically, yeah, women were pretty influential in this stuff, but I feel like it was tainted by the overall attitude that the patriarchy had set in stone. And so women were merely picking this back up and utilizing it as society had already been using it. So there wasn't much of a nuanced position when it came to like consent in the matter. Um, Eugenics found support across the ideological spectrum. In addition to the feminists, some of the era's most outspoken progressives endorsed some manner of eugenics. Theodore Roosevelt, the most famous progressive of all, was characteristically unreserved in his beliefs. A few years after leaving the White House, he wrote a magazine article declaring, I wish very much that the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. He insisted that feeble-minded persons, quote, should be forbidden to leave the offspring behind them. Ooh, all right. Uh, 